All right, that's our topic for this evening, hats, vestments, and uh, colors, as the 10th in our little series of uh, our liturgical course. And we're going to start at a very unusual place when it comes to vestments and colors, and that's with hats. And I started to, uh, decided to start with these hats for various reasons. First of all, who is entitled to wear what? illustrates in some ways who does what in the liturgy. And often hats, oddly enough, are an indication of a person's denomination. So having some idea about hats or headgear uh, will help when we come to look at liturgical garments. Hats also, all through the centuries, uh, have been closely related to concepts of power. And you only need to think about crowns or uniforms to be reminded of that. Also, the question of hats or headgear is also highly theologically charged. Should women wear hats in church? Still controversial, this one. Should men remove their hats when they're in church? And if so, uh, why in both cases? So let's, first of all, remember that hats have been a sign of social status since the beginning. First of all, no prizes for guessing the Anglican and the Roman Catholic in these two pictures. Here's a little clue. Uh, the thing on the left is a beretta, and the thing on the right is a Canterbury cap. We'll hear about these in a little minute and what the significance of these two little things are. Uh, but here you can see that the hats that, that clergy wear and others uh, can often be a little indicator of the denomination that they belong to. A beretta has three points on the top, presumably to symbolize the Trinity, I don't know. Uh, and a Canterbury cap has four points on the top of it um, for, I don't know, four Gospels or something. There's always a reason for numbers. Here you go. Uh, hats in church and women wearing hats in church. Just because a woman wears a hat in the church doesn't necessarily mean that the woman is subject to the man, at least not now, because we have here Catherine Jeffert Shorey uh, wearing a hat in church, a mitre in this particular case. Uh, when she went to England, incidentally, they told her that she couldn't wear a mitre. Uh, so she went into church bareheaded. Uh, against the strictures of Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, I believe. Uh, so the Church of England rather uh, 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 approved of her disobeying the, um, uh, the, 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 the Bible uh, than being allowed to wear a mitre uh, as a presiding bishop uh, in the Anglican Church. Ironic. Here's a hat. Uh, just to illustrate a little point before we get going, this is something called the Imperial State Crown, and it's the workaday crown of the British monarch. This is not the crown that she's crowned in, that's the St. Edward's crown. Uh, this is the normal symbol of state in England. As you can see, it incorporates the Black Prince's ruby there in the middle of the thing. It was worn by Henry V of England at the Battle of Agincourt. And below it is the Cullinan II diamond. The Cullinan I diamond is in the scepter uh, of the Queen. And that was m uh, found or mined in South Africa in 1905. Already that you can see that these hats, especially crowns, carry a great deal of history and significance to them, both as um, symbols of power but also symbols of, of status and wealth and all of the rest of it. There's the Queen wearing this thing at the state opening, opening of Parliament, saying, you know, this year my government will cut social security and raise taxes on the poor. Uh, so, you know, wearing this hat in the, uh, you know, declaring what Mrs. Thatcher's about to do to the country or uh, uh, any other socialist government is about to do to the country, the hat carries a deep significance with it. Here you can see an altar front at St. John the Divine. What can you see on it? Curiously enough, the very same symbol. Uh, they're quite we, I should say, because I'm a trustee of the cathedral. 
uh, are quite proud of this altar front. Uh, it was presented by the Queen Mother to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine shortly after the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, these, this, these were drapes that were stuck in the nave of the church uh, for the commoners um, of Westminster Abbey. Uh, where the royalty sat and the aristocrats sat, the drapes were gold. So these are sort of offcuts from the coronation, basically, uh, that were presented by the Queen Mother uh, to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. But just let's think about this for one little second. It's a lovely blue advent color, but look underneath the crown. Look at the shape of the crown first, but look underneath the crown and you will see roses, thistles, shamrocks, and uh, daffodils, I believe, or leeks. These are the nationalist symbols of uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. This altar frontal is unambiguously imperialist and English. And whenever I see that crown, symbol of authority, this is what I think of. I think I owe taxes. I think I'm visiting a prison. Uh, I think the policeman is about to come and say something to me. See, the imperial state crown on the top of here, it's on the money uh, uh, to do with finances. Uh, over here, it's over the skull and crossbones of the 100th uh, Royal Air Force Division. Uh, it's on all military insignia as well, and it's on uh, Her Majesty's revenue and customs. So it's an interesting question about what messages our liturgical bits and bobs convey. Even though they might be a pretty color and have an interesting history, uh, a prestigious history, they may carry meanings that lie underneath there, and we shouldn't just assume one thing about them when we look at them. So it's an interesting object lesson uh, in what our liturgical colors and symbols can actually convey to us, uh, to others, without our realizing it. So, um, uh, here are uh, this question about whether or not women should be wearing hats in church. We'll be coming back to this. Um, uh, I always used to, when I was a child, and if you went to church, people still wore hats. Women most definitely wore hats in church. And, you know, as a child, you always seemed to be stuck behind the biggest one <laughs> in the entire congregation, and you couldn't actually see what was going on up at the, up at the front. A mitre. Uh, is a good example of this uh, symbolism within the church. Uh, the word is derived from the Greek, and it means a sort of headband uh, that could be anything from a sort of hairband, an Alice band, if you want, uh, for women, to a victor's garland at the games uh, when they were crowned at the end if they were the winners, uh, or a badge of rank in the Ptolemaic court in Egypt. The word is also used uh, to describe the um, headdress of the Jewish high priest in the Greek version of the Old Testament. Um, the mitre and the papal tiara, which we'll look at in, in a brief second, uh, derive from a cap that was used by officials in the Byzantine court. It was probably a sort of Phrygian cap, that is a cap that was worn uh, by the Phrygians, a little tribe, a little further to the east uh, there. The first mention of its use by a bishop in the Western church dates from about 1049. Here's the development of the mitre. Here you can most definitely see it looks like a Phrygian cap with these little tassels coming down. If you look up uh, a Phrygian cap, you'll see the statues of these things, and you can see how it's slowly evolved into the shape that it's taken today. Um, uh, it's a sort of pointed, foldy cap um, uh, that rises to a peak, uh, and now it has these two little tabs that stick down at the back. See, on the left-hand side? It's a sort of instantly recognizable shape from a chess piece here that you can see on the right, but in this case without the lappets, these two little tassels on the back. Sometimes the mitre itself is in white, 
and the lappets here at the back are in the liturgical color of the season. That's not always the case, but that's sometimes the way that these mitres are worn. Um, in the Roman church, uh, and in the Anglican church too, uh, the mitre is worn by bishops, uh, abbots, and abbesses. Uh, so uh, it's not just, a, historically, it's not just been a man's hat, it's also been w uh, worn by uh, women abbots of, of, of uh, convents, monasteries. And in the Roman Catholic Church, it's also worn by cardinals uh, and people uh, who are bishops but don't have a specific diocese that they're assigned to. Presumably that's the case uh, in the Anglican Church as well, worldwide. It comes in all sorts of different colors, and its use is very circumscribed by these sort of liturgical uh, regulations. For instance, it's worn in procession. It's then taken off for the opening of a communion service. It's put back on again for singing the Gloria. It's removed for the readings. It's put back on again for the sermon. It's removed for the canon of the mass and put back on again for the blessing and the recessional. It's, it's a real fiddle. Here you go. This is from uh, the Church of the Advent in Boston, and it's their little um, uh, uh, altar service book. And it gives very inst uh, specific instructions to the poor old person who is supposed to be looking after the bishop's mitre when the bishop comes on a visitation. The mitre is worn when the bishop is moving, seated, including during the act of confirmation or ordination, or pronouncing absolution or giving a blessing. The mitre is removed during the collect, the gospel, the prayers of the people, the confession, the Eucharistic prayer, and the post-communion prayer. The bishop may remove his or own, her own mitre or may turn to you to remove it. Grasp it at the sides with your fingertips and remove it sideways so that you do not hit the bishop in the face with the lappets, especially if your ordination is at stake. Hold the mitre on your upturned palms with the front facing you and the lappets hanging freely. When the bishop is ready to put it on again, turn it so that the front faces down and fold the lappets up over the back so that they're out of the way. The bishop will then take it from you and whip it over his or her head so that the lappets fall down the back. If the bishop will be without the mitre for some time, such as the, the Eucharistic prayer, you may place the mitre on the bishop's throne with the front facing the back of the chair and the lappets spread out neatly over the cushion. What a palaver, I would say. You can understand why the reformers decided that this was no longer going to be worn. In fact, in the Anglican Church, the use of the mitre did not come back again until the late 1800s. And even now, I will tell you, there is some controversy within the Anglican Church about whether bishops can be bothered with this uh, frustrating little piece of headgear. Um, Newly ordained bishops often complain that the protocol around the use of the mitre is the worst job that they have to learn. Uh, it must not be worn when the bishop is praying, for instance. The general symbolism goes something like this. This, this mitre is a symbol of the bishop's apostolic authority. And therefore, the mitre can be worn when the bishop is addressing the people but not when the bishop is addressing God. Now, can you see why this is a problem? What's going on when a bishop confirms somebody? Or when a bishop ordains somebody? Whom is the bishop addressing? The person or God? So some bishops will decide that they're not going to wear a mitre when they confirm or ordain. Other bishops will decide that they will. But you can bet that if you have a little education around the use of the mitre, you're going to be watching very carefully when the bishop wears it and when the bishop doesn't. Because if they know what they're doing, they're communicating a message by the use of their headgear. Um, an Anglican bishop uh, in England once gave this valuable piece of advice uh, to a newly ordained colleague. Don't pray in it and don't fuss with it. That's probably the clearest instruction that a bishop could ever receive about this little piece of um, headgear. 
Can you see what's happening a little bit? We saw this last week and the week before. If the thing becomes cluttered and becomes a thing that is there for its own sake and doesn't serve a powerful, as a powerful symbol in the worship of the people, it's there for some other reason. And it becomes cluttered and annoying and distracting, like too many candles on the altar, uh, for instance. It's there for the sake of it and not for the sake of the people or the ceremony. So, as I've said, the mitre fell out of use in the Reformation churches, and, and including the Church of England. Um, it's probably an apocryphal explanation, uh, but it goes something like this. The shape of the mitre is supposed to imitate the shape of the flames that came down on the apostles' heads uh, at Pentecost. And these lappets that fall down at the back here are supposed to invoke the, um, or be a sort of subliminal reference to the bookmarks in the, uh, in the, in the altar book or in the, in the Bible, the, the hangings that come down, you know, the colored hangings in the Bible. But I think that this is a retrospective reflection trying to make sense of a, of a shape that evolved through history in a, a very specific way, as you can see, it looked like a, a thing there, but then it turned into a loaf and then something else until eventually it achieved the, the, the shape it's got uh, today. This thing um, that looks like sort of Russian Christmas cake uh, is the three-tiered papal tiara. And it's not been used by any pope uh, since the coronation of Pope Paul in 1963. At Vatican II Council, very spectacularly, the Pope uh, removed the papal tiara and never put it back on again, saying that it was a symbol of a church that was gone, in theory, uh, after Vatican II. Uh, that you can see here that it looks more like a crown than anything else, that it's intended to symbolize the threefold authority of the Pope, uh, spiritual and temporal and something else, I can't quite remember what. Uh, um, but anyway, it's, it's not been used by any pope uh, since 1963. In fact, some of them have been sold. Uh, a famous uh, one that was given by Milan, I think, to one of the popes in the late 1800s, uh, uh, was supposed to be sold for the benefit of the poor. Uh, it was, I think, bought by Cardinal Spellman. Uh, who sent it on a tour of America to raise money for the poor, so people had to pay to see it. It's now on display in uh, the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Washington. Uh, popes, since the re renunciation of this thing, uh, have worn various things, uh, including this jolly little red hat here, uh, a fancy red hat that's called a Capello Romano, it's got embroidery on it. As you can see, there's a gold embroidery that we can see there, but the sort of embroidery, uh, embroidery around the top of it. Uh, and popes often wear also a white uh, zucchetto. Does the pope have a funny hat? Yes, and not just the pope either. So the pope and the bishops of the Catholic Church wear a mitre at mass. Here's the mitre that we've just been talking about. Uh, here's the little Capello Romano for everyday wear. There we go just for popping out to Whole Foods. Uh, and you can see it has this sort of swirly embroidery uh, on it. Um, also, in winter, the Pope may choose to wear the warm woolen hat with a white trim of ermine uh, here. I don't think we've seen that since Pope Benedict to the 16th, who was fond of his red Gucci shoes as well that went very nicely with the hat. And I don't know if he had a matching clutch, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> The Pope also uh, wears a zucchetto, this little sort of skull cap here. Can you see it? Uh, the Pope is the only one that's allowed to wear a white one. Uh, in fact, uh, this is probably because, uh, not because just because he's the Pope, but it makes him easy to spot. Uh, like the Queen wears those bright primary colors so that she stands out in the crowd. Um, and so wherever you see the little white zucchetto bobbing around, 
Uh, was he wearing one where you saw him, yes. Joris? Yes. Yes? <laughs> yes. Is that how you spotted him? Well, he was in full stature with his white clothes, so you cannot m miss him. Like, he was right. in Rome, randomly in one of the church, he, he came to pray. So you can oh. see him in, in white, that's true. It's easy to spot. <laughs> easy to spot in the white. Yeah. Um, cardinals wore this uh, big red hat here that you can see the top, the Galero. This is until 1965 when it was sort of revised. They still wear it, but it's much simplified. Can you see all of these little tassels here on the side of it? The number of tassels that were on a, um, a, a Galero indicated the status of the cardinal, and they decided to abandon this as a status symbol uh, in 1965, so now the hats are a lot more simple. Um, They're still represented on their uh, coat of arms. Though. On the coat of arms, yeah, yeah with the number of tassels. Yeah. Uh, cardinals can also wear a little red beretta or a little red zucchetto. That here, like the Pope wears a white one, a cardinal wears a red one. A bishop is going to wear a purple one, a purple beretta, a purple uh, zucchetto. A priest will wear a black one, and a Franciscan friar is going to wear a brown one. So these are ways of spotting people's status, even today, uh, not only within the uh, Roman Catholic Church, but also in the Anglican Church, where very often these little zucchettos or, or little berets are worn uh, by priests and bishops. In fact, I don't know if any of our bishops wear one. Anybody know? I, I, think, I think I've seen uh, Bishop Andy wearing a zucchetto occasionally. Um, uh, priests, as you can see, have this similar uh, range of headgear, ranging from the black beretto th uh, through this black zucchetto or a sort of wide-brimmed hat uh, that's intended to be worn out of doors there. You can see that. Now, some Anglican clergy have taken on the Roman usage, and it's a sure sign, if you're an Anglican or an Episcopalian, of your churchmanship if you take to wearing a beretta or a little black zucchetto. Uh, but there's a further range of reformed church hats that can also be worn. We looked at this Canterbury cap, this square cloth hat here that Cranmer is wearing on the left with these protruding sharp corners on it. Uh, the good thing about this little cap is that you can roll it up and stick it in your pocket. That's a bit harder to do with a collapsible beretta. That, that, that you can't stick in your coat pocket if you're doing a funeral or out in the cold or something or sitting in a church in the freezing cold in the middle of the countryside uh, trying to keep yourself warm for morning or evening prayer. Uh, you can wear it for processions or when you're sitting down to listening to, to the readings or standing up to give a sermon. But once again, you can't wear any headgear to pray or to preside at the sacraments. You must take off whatever it is that you're wearing when you pray in church. Um, so as I mentioned before, this, this Canterbury cap has these four ridges as opposed to the Beretta's three ridges. There's a fascinating little book called The Parson's Handbook, and it's written in lively style by a man called Percy Dearmer. Uh, and it was published in 1899. So it was after the Oxford movement where a lot of fuss was made about what people wore in church and what everything was all about. And what he says about hats is this. There is no conceivable reason for an English churchman to discard their own shape of hat in favour of a foreign one, except that the Beretta offends an immense number of excellent lay folk and thus makes the recovery of the church more difficult. So, when an Anglican sees a Beretta, he thinks that the Jesuits are coming for him. Uh, and it caused a great deal of controversy in the Oxford movement, for instance, when some of the Oxford movement clergy took to wearing this Beretta instead of the good old-fashioned uh, English Canterbury cap uh, or this stylish little outfit that you can hear on the right. 
Uh, this was a chap who'd once been, I think, assistant chaplain to the Queen, and he had a very colourful history, and always dressed like this, instantly recognisable as an Anglican, even given the shoes, uh, but given this uh, shovel hat, you can see exactly what's going on here. Let's talk for a minute about why are some men, then, allowed to wear hats in church? Why can clergy wear hats in church over the centuries, but all lay people had to remove their hats in church? It's funny, because uh, it seems to be against the Bible. These little hats seem to serve two functions. They designate a person's authority or role in the service. That is to say, if somebody is wearing a hat in church, a zucchetta or a Canterbury cap, or a mitre, or anything else, you know that they're about to do something, apart from be a part of the worshipping body as a layperson. Secondly, when a person who has authority in church, like a priest, or a bishop, or a deacon, or an archbishop or something, whether they be a man or a woman now, they point up the symbolism of certain parts of the liturgy. Is the person doing the work there praying or learning? Are they wearing a hat or not? Are they celebrating a sacrament or are they observing some other solemn moment in the service, like a, the Gloria, for instance, or a blessing? That Those two things are not sacraments, but the bishop generally tends to stand up and put on a mitre when she's um, uh, singing the Gloria or when the Gloria is being sung. So you can see that these hats are serving not just to designate authority, they're also being used as sort of liturgical uh, symbols that indicate what's going on in the service when people take them off or, or put them back on again. Now the question of women wearing hats in church is still controversial today. Uh, unfortunately, it has scriptural basis in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 11. Here you can see it on the screen. Any man who prays or prophes uh, prophesies with something on his head disgraces his head. But any woman who prays or prophes prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. It is one and the same thing as having her head shaved, says Paul. For if a woman will not veil herself, then she should cut off her hair. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, she should wear a veil. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, interestingly enough, because of the angels. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head unveiled? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is degrading to him? But if a woman has long hair, it's her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if anyone is disposed to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So you can see it was controversial even in Paul's time. People have tried to explain this for all sorts of, uh, all sorts of reasons. They've said it was very specific to Corinth, that uh, there, there were, you know, ladies of, of um, les dames de petite vertu uh, who would uh, uh, advertise their wares by not wearing a head covering. Uh, and therefore, if you came into church uh, not wearing a head covering, you were dis disgracing God. Uh, it's thought that women would grow their hair very long as their glory, whereas men would uh, have shorter hair. It's, it, there's all sorts of fuss and palaver that has been generated around this that is actually, quite frankly, mostly to do with a sort of... Um, uh, uh, the establishment of male authority within the church and this connection between the wearing of a, of a, of a hat in church and, and what's getting in the way of you and the angels. What the early Christian writers said was, remember, when you're in a church service, uh, there are two, two congregations present. There's a human congregation, but the angels are also present, and women should veil themselves in the presence of these angels, uh, like Mary veiled herself at the Annunciation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Joris, did you want to add something to this? Yeah, it's interesting the because the angels subject. are also veiled. They're often uh, depicted yes. veiled mm -hmm. in their wings. So there is some form of, uh, of resonance with that. And I'm thinking like it's also societies which are where you have a lot of expectation of, on, on, um, on whatever you wear. Like you wear something because you have a certain status. So it's not, for us, it sounds strange that he's giving guidelines about outfit, but it's so common, you know, in this type of societies mm -hmm. that it's not shocking really mm -hmm. that women are asked to be, to have a headgear because you, there were some laws about what you could wear and not wear. So it's, it's interesting. It's all so connected with it. Um, the early church took Paul à la lettre until at least 1700s, uh, Christian women in Europe and in the Middle East and in Africa wore head coverings out of doors. And anybody who didn't uh, was thought to have loose morals. And head covering for women in church, uh, that is in the Roman Catholic Church even, uh, was required, uh, especially when receiving the Eucharist, right up until the Code of Canon Law in 1983. That was the date when things changed a little. Uh, Luther, in fact, encouraged wives to wear a veil in public worship, and so did Calvin. So this is something that survived the Reformation. It wasn't considered to be you know, a Roman Catholic thing. Uh, it was considered to be to do with gender, and that transcended any denominational uh, considerations. Um, Wesley, in fact, uh, held that a woman in a religious assembly should keep on her veil. I remember, and, and I can understand this a little bit more clearly, really, when you look at it from an Islamic point of view in a mosque, uh, the women are divided from the men. But imagine how you pray in a mosque. If you have mixed congregations of everybody bowing down and performing the Islamic prostrations, uh, I remember a, a Muslim friend of mine said, it's extremely distracting. Uh, it's not a position that you necessarily want to see women praying in if you're behind them. Well, you know, uh, I'm sure this, um, this transcends gender in all sorts of different ways. Uh, but I'm wondering if in the early church, just as in some Muslim societies nowadays with the wearing of the veil, uh, that it is thought to be distracting to the men to have women uh, uh, dressed in an, what they would consider to be a provocative fashion. Uh, if so, I think that argument has well and truly had its day uh, and should be put in the dustbin together with Paul's teachings on a number of other controversial topics, especially in those letters that are not actually written by Paul, uh, but were produced a little bit later on in the church's history, uh, like the pastoral epistles um, that, that we read uh, after 1 and 2 Corinthians. Um, you can see here in the early church, in the catacombs, the, 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 the woman praying with, with a veiled head, with the shawl over her head. Uh, here, uh, a bishop veiling a consecrated virgin here on the left, I think. Um, and here you can see a, a medieval, uh, she's not a, 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 a religious, uh, this is a, a veiled woman, and on the right-hand side there, a painting of Goya uh, with a, um, a, a woman in a mantilla, uh, which is still worn in very many places in the world, uh, even today. And here, a group of Amish uh, who go outside uh, with veiled heads, according to, the, um, uh, according to Paul. Now, obviously, this is partly a question of biblical interpretation, and perhaps we can come back to it when we look at the question of gender in liturgy, which is going to be one of the topics that we cover in our uh, little series on the liturgy. At the moment, perhaps it's best just to observe that Paul is, in fact, writing for a very specific time and a very specific place uh, with very specific cultural practices. One last little illustration of this. When I was in Nigeria... Uh, for a few months um, at a, a quite a reformed mission where my friend from college was a, a surgeon, a missionary surgeon. And I went out there to work as a little chaplain for a little while. 
Now, the Northern Irish Protestant uh, uh, minister of that mission required all of the African women who came to church to wear a bra because he said it was terribly distracting to have the choir dancing into the church braless in the African um, dresses. The women rebelled against this because the only place that you could buy bras was behind a little clothing store at the local market. They were all hidden and the only women that wore bras were prostitutes. So you can see clothing has this really potent uh, uh, cultural aspect to it. And if we think that we can impose the culture of Paul's Corinth onto the culture of 21st century New York without asking ourselves some really serious questions, examining both Paul's culture and our own culture, then what we're doing is not biblical and not appropriate. So what goes for bras also goes for hats. You can imagine some cultures uh, where hats have a completely different uh, connotation to them. Let's think about vestments then now. This is a general word, vestments, uh, for garments and, and articles uh, that are associated with the Christian religion, especially in the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church and the Lutheran Church. Uh, in the earliest Christian churches, leaders wore normal dress of civilians in the Greco-Roman world. But even as early as 300 AD, modifications started to be made that were specifically liturgical to these garments. And by the 1200s, in fact, clerical dress had pretty much been standardized. Uh, the Reformation simplified a lot of these vestments. They did away with many of the colors, many of the forms of the dress, especially when it came to Holy Communion. In general, I would say, before we start looking at these vestments in more specifics, these vestments are supposed to remind ourselves, if we're wearing them, and remind others of who we are, what we are, um, and what we're supposed to be expressing through our worship. They should be worn deliberately and not lightly. They should be worn seriously and with thought, because when you put them on, um, your posture changes somewhat, your feeling changes a little bit. And those of you who've, who've worn vestments for any reason whatsoever will know this. And if you haven't worn vestments, I'm sure we can give you an opportunity to do that uh, for one reason or another in leading morning and evening prayer or, or assisting at the altar so that you can feel a little bit of what, what that feels like. Let's start with the most boring of the vestments, and that is the clerical collar. Uh, in 1215, a council of the church made it mandatory for all clergy to wear distinctive dress in line with the medieval uh, clothing laws, you know, how long you, the point on your shoes could be, uh, who was allowed to wear ermine or silk. Um, now, this wasn't to make clergy more important than other people. Uh, the mandate of the Council of 1215 said clergy should wear distinctive dress to make clear to the public what their job was, a bit like a uniform. Uh, I remember somebody I was ordained with, who shall be nameless, who said, I don't like wearing a clerical collar out in the streets in London because it just encourages tramps to ask me for money. I was thinking, well, surely that's the point. <laughs> it seems a little silly. Anyway, today there are a variety of collars that can be worn. This little white part of it that you can see derives from the Victorian necktie. Uh, it was a long white cloth that people would tie around their neck, a little bit like the modern day uh, ascot or cravat. Um, and the black color here uh, was chosen not because it makes a uh, priest look a bit more solemn or a little more scary, but simply because black dye was the easiest and the cheapest to produce. Other colors were much harder to produce and they, the color would wear out of them very quickly 
uh, also would wash out of them. White was actually quite hard to produce, actually, uh, either in when it came to linen or, or in wool, because it demanded certain chemicals, it demanded certain times of year when it could be bleached in the sun, uh, whereas black could be produced very easily uh, through a variety of different means. Um, this tab collar you see on the left is quite common. There's just a little channel or funnel that goes uh, around and about, and you slip in your little plastic bit uh, at the front. You can get linen ones as well, but they're actually more expensive to launder uh, than, than, than to buy. Uh, to buy a linen collar costs you about $8, and to launder it properly costs you 12 So It doesn't make any sense, does it, really? Perhaps it's more ecological, I don't know. Um, it used to be said that the higher the clerical collar, the lower the churchmanship. So if it goes way up here, you're an evangelical, and if it went way down there, you were more likely to be Anglo-Catholic. This is in the case of the all-round collar here that's worn, I think, more by Protestants than, than, than Catholics. You'll probably see a Catholic in something like this where the white is visible just a little bit above. Anglicans wear them too. I have both types. I will not stoop to this collar on the left. I've never liked these tunnel collars for a variety of reasons. I, I think they look untidy. Uh, this on the right here is called a rabat. Uh, and it's, it's, you wear a collarless shirt with it. Uh, and this whole bit here sticks on the front like a waistcoat and gets attached at the back uh, with little collar studs. Uh, here's one. Here are the little collar studs and here are these ghastly plastic collars with holes in that are supposed to make them breathe easier. And those are the collar studs there on the right. I think only clergy and barristers, solicitors in England, uh, people in the court still wear these sorts of shirts now. I'm not sure that they're terribly widespread. There's a lovely old tradition, actually, within the Church of England, and that is uh, if you have mentored somebody through an ordination process, or being their spiritual director or something, when they're ordained, you give them one of your collar studs or a little set of your collar studs, ones that you have most certainly worn yourself, sometimes ones that have been handed down to you in a line. So when, um, when Ted Pardo was ordained, for instance, uh, I gave him a whalebone collar stud that had been given to me by the person who mentored me, and it had been given to him by the person who mentored him, and back about two or three generations of priests, uh, I think. Um, it, uh, the Roman Catholic clergy are allowed to wear black, grey, or blue clerical shirts, but in most countries they're just going to opt for a black one. However, the other colours are considered to be a little bit Protestant. So uh, here on the left, you can sort of barely recognise that this man is a priest, I think. It's rather, it's rather droll, isn't it? Uh, uh, and on the right there, we've got somebody who looks as if she's about to perform oral surgery. Uh, the sort of blue shirts, well, they're nice and cool, but well, I'm just a stuffy old-fashioned thing. <laughs> I generally, t I've got one grey shirt which I occasionally wear in summer, uh, and I quite like wearing it actually. But I, I, I go for black or grey. I'm not sure I'd be caught dead in this. <laughs> so, so bear that in mind. If you have to dress me up in my coffin, um, <laughs> please don't put me in that. Let's talk about uh, uh, the cassock. Now, there's a big distinction made between the types of vestments that are used for Holy Communion and the type of vestments that are going to be used for other services. So, if you are not celebrating Communion, you'll probably be wearing something that is referred to as choir dress, the, the sort of dress that you wear for the daily office. And as we know, uh, you don't have to be ordained to do the daily office. You can be a layperson uh, and do the daily office. 
in which case you can wear choir dress. Why is it called choir dress? Well, because the daily office was read in the choir of the church and not up at the high altar of the church that was reserved for the celebration of Holy Communion. So communion dress is worn at the altar, choir dress that is worn for morning and evening prayer and other non-sacramental services, uh, those services are led from the choir and not from the altar. Now, for the Eucharist, each piece of the vestment that you wear symbolizes some sort of spiritual dimension of the priesthood. Let's talk about the cassock for a minute. This cassock is this long, black, close-fitting robe uh, that's worn by Catholics, it's worn by Eastern Orthodox, it's worn by Anglicans, it's worn by Lutherans, it's worn by Methodists, and it's worn by certain uh, other Reformed churches. Sometimes in the Reformed church, the cassock will be replaced by a black preaching gown, uh, which looks like an academic gown. Essentially, I don't think I've put a picture of that one uh, in there. Now, the cassock is not a specifically priestly dress. Uh, the word comes from the French, in fact, uh, cassac, uh, which simply means a long coat. It's Middle French, I think I read. Uh, it could come from Cossack. Uh, the Cossacks uh, wore these long uh, ankle-length uh, robes, and it's thought that it worked its way into French uh, through the word Cossack, uh, cassac. Uh, there's a slight difference in the style of these cassocks. Uh, Anglicans use both single-breasted and double-breasted cassocks. So here on the left, you can see a cassock with buttons all the way down. See that? That's considered to be a single-breasted cassock with buttons that run up and down. This on the right is a double-breasted cassock. Can you see there's a button here, a button here, and a little button here. This flaps over so that you do it up inside and outside, inside uh, and outside on both sides. This sort of cassock would probably not be worn by uh, a Roman Catholic. It's considered to be a little bit Anglican. Uh, there's a little button here to attach an academic hood. If you're wearing choir dress, uh, you can, for morning and evening prayer, uh, you can attach an academic hood to your outfit. If you're celebrating communion, you would never, ever, ever wear an academic hood. That's you're in the presence of God here, not the academia. <laughs> Uh, for why it's worn for morning and evening prayer, I'm not really quite sure. Could just be an English tradition, I don't know. In some cathedrals, uh, it was considered infra dig to process down the aisle uh, if you uh, were leading morning or evening prayer without wearing your academic hood and carrying an academic cap in your hand. I'm sure that tradition has now disappeared. Um, so... Uh, some Anglican cassocks have 39 buttons down the front uh, that symbolize the 39 articles. Oh, our joke used to be 40 lashes minus one, which used to be one of the medieval punishments that were handed out instead of the stocks uh, because it took you know 39 minutes to button the damn thing up, uh, <laughs> let alone trying to remember each one of the 39 articles as you did it. Um, a white alb can be worn over the top of a cassock. Uh, a white alb, can you see some of them are just sort of, they look like nightgowns really. They're just sort of white cotton ankle length robes. In the olden days, what you would end up having to do is put a cassock on first, and then over the top of a cassock, you would put on a white alb. We'll, we'll talk about an amis in a minute. But nowadays, this hybrid thing has come out called a cassock alb, which we wear at uh, Saint Esprit sometimes. Uh, it's horrid in the winter to have to wear this, uh, in the summer, to have to wear this and an alb over the top and a chasuble over the top of that and a stole. It can get really rather hot and sweaty. So these albs, these cassock albs, were invented to get over that problem. I don't really like them, to be very honest, uh, but needs must. And, uh, I, don't uh, really understand. I don't really understand what's the cassock alb. A cassock alb is a white cassock, essentially. Okay. 
So it's intended to look like you're wearing a cassock and an alb, okay. uh, but actually what you're doing is wearing a white cassock. Mm, but you don't want to call it a white cassock uh, because only the Pope can wear a white cassock. So you're stuck, aren't you? You have to call it a cassock alb, and very often it's got floppy sleeves and it looks a bit more like an alb than it does a cassock. Well, it, it looks very much more like an alb than a cassock. For instance, the two that we have at Santa, uh, we've got three at Santa Esprit, I think maybe even four, uh, they have pleats in them in odd places and they have big baggy sleeves. So it's this long white garment that can be worn by any minister at the Eucharist. That is, it can be worn by somebody assisting at the altar. Once again, because it's a cassock alb, it's not, in my mind, a specifically ordained person's thing to wear. And the white color of this thing symbolizes the baptismal garment. So as you put it on, you remember you're being clothed with righteousness. You're rising up out of the baptismal waters and being clothed with this new garment of righteousness, washed uh, in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, the prayer that you're supposed to say uh, as you put it on. It also symbolizes this white thing, uh, a withdrawal from all the bustle of life. This is not something very practical that you'd wear to go to the shops or do a bit of gardening or something. Um, it's really not the most practical of things to wear for ordinary everyday pursuits. And it's designed that way. It's designed, when you put it on, to make you think you're about to do something very special, something that is withdrawn in liturgical time and doesn't belong to the ordinary round of, of daily uh, tasks. A stall is a long, narrow uh, strip of cloth that's draped around your neck. Uh, deacons will wear this stall draped across the left shoulder, diagonally across the body. Uh, it can sometimes, well, very often actually, have a little fringe on the bottom here. You can see this fringe. And this fringe echoes the dress that was used in the temple in Jerusalem by the priests, the fringed garment of Aaron, for instance, uh, with bells and pomegranates on, on the bottom. They're very often elaborately decorated, as you can see, and they, uh, they evoke the color of the season, which we'll come back to uh, in a minute. What's it supposed to symbolize, this stole? Why do, why do people wear it? Well, uh, it's supposed to symbolize the bonds or the fetters which, with which Jesus was bound uh, during his passion. It's an evocation of Jesus' passion. And as you put it on, you're about to celebrate at the altar and remember the offering of Christ on the cross. So as you put this uh, stole on, sometimes people kiss the little cross at the top of it here, uh, evoking uh, a little prayer uh, that remembers death, uh, Christ's, uh, Christ's death on the cross and the bounds and the fetters uh, that were, um, that, with which Jesus was bound uh, during the Passion. Sometimes people say it also symbolizes this commandment of Jesus that's laid on your shoulders uh, to go and make disciples of all nations. So it's also uh, the idea that you, it's, a, it's a stall of commission. You're being commissioned to go out there. The chasuble is... Um, do I, here we go. Here's a couple of chasubai, chasubles. Uh, it, it's the outermost liturgical vestment that's worn by clergy when they're celebrating the Eucharist. We don't tend to wear them at Saint Esprit for two reasons. Uh, well, used to be three reasons, but one of those reasons has since disappeared. It used to be thought of as terribly high church, this chasuble. Uh, and if you wore it, you were thought to be flirting with Rome. Uh, I think that idea has now well and truly disappeared. Uh, although in some churches perhaps that association is still there. Secondly, we have limited space at Saint Esprit, and if you're going to drape an enormous embroidered poncho over yourself, you're going to be knocking stuff over, or maybe even setting yourself on fire, uh, uh, or at least knocking over one of the flower arrangements. Uh, sometimes liturgical garments have to be pared down to the symbolic minimum, uh, and a chasuble is a small sacrifice to make to that end. 
uh, you want to keep things safe. Thirdly, these things are expensive, and I'll show you a picture of their price in a minute or two, uh, and I've tended to think in the past uh, we have more important things to spend our money on just at the moment than this, although if somebody wants to give us money for some of these purposes, uh, especially uh, in commemoration of somebody like we did for Jacques Maman, for instance, where we bought a new green set for the altar uh, and new bookmarks for the altar, uh, then that's a nice way of remembering somebody. But these things are, you know, are worth thousands of, of dollars sometimes. So this chasuble, uh, it's worn over a cassock and an alb and a stole. So the stole goes underneath everything. Or it's worn over a cassock, alb and stole like we do at Saint Esprit. And actually this cassock is derived from this little outer travelling garment that was worn in the later Roman Empire. So it was a little outside poncho that you'd put on to keep yourself warm over the top of the stuff that you would wear inside. A little bit like a Roman overcoat, if you want. Sort of poncho. What does it symbolise? Well, as you put on the chasuble, uh, you're supposed to say the prayer, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the words of Jesus uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. So you're taking on the yoke of Christ as you put on this chasuble uh, over your head. There's a right side and a wrong side uh, that um, you have to know which way to put it on. These things are called orphories here at the front. They're often very elaborately embroidered and decorated, while the rest of the chasuble can sometimes be quite plain. Um, the right side and the wrong side mean that you have an opening here at the front and at the back it comes up and it's closed. Sometimes people make an, an awful song and dance about this. The bishop will pr uh, process in in mitre and cope. Uh, we will talk about the cope in a minute. And uh, then we'll um, you know, do the sermon in mitre and cope. And then when it comes to the communion, the bishop has to get dressed in a chasuble. However, the bishop is wearing a pectoral cross. Uh, the cope and the mitre have to be taken off. The pectoral cross has to be taken off. And then the chasuble has to be put on. And then the pectoral cross has to be put back on again. In the meantime, the lay people are hanging around wondering when on earth this, uh, this puppet show will have finished. Um, because it's, it doesn't look very much, it doesn't look as if we're participating in something. And it's not as if there's an indication in the bulletin that says what the bishop is doing now is taking on the yoke of Christ and you are invited to participate in this th through the following prayer. It can often look very arcane and it can look like ceremony for the sake of ceremony. I'm not mocking that or, 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 or doing it down. I'm not saying that it takes up too much time for the sake of time, but sometimes it does, but it could be explained a little bit more carefully. A catastrophe happens if the bishop happens to put the blasted thing on back to front and then has, and puts his cross on first, as happened at the consecration chrism mass two years ago at the cathedral, uh, and it delayed proceedings by a further 10 minutes while the organ was playing and, the, uh, and everything else was going on. So once again, if these things become a distraction to the main liturgical ceremony that, that, that you're learning through and participating in and praying through, and they become things for themselves that, that maybe, well, maybe only the angels understand and that's why it should be done. Uh, but um, it, it, you can see that sometimes it, it sort of takes on an energy uh, of its own. I think that's enough. That there's a chasuble from uh, the medieval uh, period. Let's talk a minute about the surplice. Here we go. Uh, here's the death of Bede, uh, the English uh, um, historian, uh, monk uh, from the north of England here. Uh, and he is surrounded by uh, Celtic priests and, and uh, uh, ministers, all wearing surplices. Obviously, it's not sur le vif. Uh, Bede died uh, in the 600s, I believe. The surplice is a vestment of the Western Church, in fact, not of the Eastern Church. It's a sort of tunic. It's always white. It's never of a different color, although I have a sort of 
a yellowish silk one, which I think has aged to yellow. Uh, and it's worn at least to the knees, uh, uh, and, uh, and it's got these very wide and baggy sleeves. The longer the surplice, the more likely it is to be worn by an Anglican. When it's very short, as here on the left, uh, it is sometimes uh, bordered in lace, as you can see here. It's still a surplice, but Anglicans tend to refer to these things as cotta, a short. It's a chopped off alb, uh, and it looks a bit more like a chopped off alb than a surplice. Look, the sleeves are tighter, and it barely comes to the knees here of this person uh, on the left. It's thought of as rather Roman Catholic, although it's used in high church Anglicanism, this little cotta uh, with, with lace on it. Interestingly enough, the surplice, which you can see here on the right with the academic hood and a preaching stole, um, first appeared in England and France. This is a French-English invention, this surplus. And then it only spread later to Italy. And interestingly enough, it seems to be derived from the Celtic alb. That is, the tunic, the alb, that was worn in the Gallican rite. And that Gallican rite was suppressed by the Roman rite after the Reformation. So out went the surplus in the Gallican French church that it had been worn for all the way through the medieval period, and in came the cassock, alb, uh, stole, and chasuble. Um, it, it escaped banishment in the Anglican reform precisely because it didn't have explicit, heavy, symbolic formulae attached to it. You just heard that when you put on all of these liturgical vestments when you're about to celebrate communion, evoking your baptism, evoking the uh, heavy burden of, you know, the, the, the bindings of Christ in the stole, uh, of the yoke of Christ when you put on the chasuble. The reformers didn't like these things. They thought it was magic. They were putting on magical robes. The surplus never had those prayers attached to it. So the Anglicans in England said, yes, absolutely, you must wear a surplus when you celebrate communion. Absolutely, that's uh, totally what we want you to do. Uh, so in the Elizabethan, uh, Elizabeth I, uh, in the prayer book, said a surplus should be worn uh, by the person presiding and by other people uh, in, in the church. So it can be worn as choir dress, as you can see it there on the right, uh, with a preaching scarf and a, a hood, or it can be worn for the celebration of sacraments, that is, a cassock, a surplus, and a coloured stole uh, um, uh, if you're celebrating communion. You're going to be wearing the stole that is appropriate for that particular uh, Sunday. A coat. There, oh, there you go. You can see them all in cassocks and surplices and a little rough round the neck. Uh, this is some sort of ch uh, choir in England at some particular period or other. And here, look what you can see. This is a military chaplain. There's the crown, the imperial state crown, uh, on the front of the preaching scarf. Uh, so it's ubiquitous, this thing. And he's wearing his medals also uh, on his preaching his medal band, see, on his preaching scarf. Uh, people sometimes wear poppies as well at this time of year in remembrance of the war dead. They would wear that on a preaching scarf, but certainly not uh, on when they were celebrating the Eucharist, uh, where, the, where the rubrics are very different. Here's a cope, or a couple of copes, or three copes altogether. Uh, a cope is a really long cloak that's open at the front, and it can be in any liturgical colour. Uh, you can wear it if you're clergy and if you're lay. This is not a specifically priestly vestment. Uh, if it's worn by a bishop, it's usually accompanied by a mitre, a cope and mitre. Uh, the little clasp that closes it here, can you see, well, it's not so little in this particular case, uh, is called a morse, and it's often very, very elaborately um, embroidered with uh, pictures of the Passion or the 
uh, or of the crucifixion or the ascension or something. Actually, it's a vestment for processions. Um, so if you're processing into the church or if you're processing for a funeral or if you're doing a procession outside in the street or if you're processing for Palm Sunday, a cope is the thing that you're going to be wearing. It's a nice warm thing to wear as well. There's also a black clerical cope which I left behind in England <coughs> which I used to wear for funerals, especially at the graveside on rainy English days. It's never worn when you're celebrating the Eucharist in a Roman Catholic church and would very rarely be used in the Anglican church if you were celebrating communion. Uh, in the Church of England, the Archbishop of... Oh, this is a famous cope in the Church of England. Uh, it's the cope of the Bishop of London. And it was made for the Queen's Silver Jubilee, I think. But here, it's rather moving, actually. There you can see St. Paul's Cathedral, the cathedral of, of, of the city of London. And all around it, you can see embroidered the, the churches of the city of London, some of them by Christopher Wren, others of, of an older nature. So it's supposed to symbolize when the bishop wears it, uh, the whole of the church gathered in the cathedral of St. Paul's. It's sort of, so these copes can often be full of this sort of symbolism of all different sorts, of the collection of the church, of the, it, because there's massive amount of space on them, uh, they often tell a story as well, these copes that illustrate what's going on in the thing. The Archbishop of Canterbury uh, and his flunkies uh, wore copes just as the Queen did here. Uh, so I told you it wasn't a um, specifically uh, priestly garment. Uh, and here we see the Queen wearing it, who's not ordained. She's, uh, she's uh, crowned in the St. Edward's crown. Here you can see that's not the crown that we've been looking at. Uh, but these these famous copes and here are all of the earls and barons and all the rest of it standing around. That's enough of that. Uh, we don't have time to cover some of the other bits and bobs that clergy and lay people uh, wear in church. Just a brief mention of the dalmatic here. A dalmatic is the deacon's chasuble uh, that's worn for communion. Uh, so you can see the sleeves are a lot shorter and it's sort of cropped in on either side here. Once again, they can be quite elaborately decor uh, decorated. Uh, there's also a cincture. A cincture is this sort of rope belt uh, that's used to hold the stole in place or to cinch your alb into your waist. Uh, a, um, a cincture sometimes in the Roman Catholic Church is a long, broad piece of cloth that very often matches the color that you're permitted to wear. Uh, for the day. So if you're a cardinal or a, or a, or a canon uh, of the cathedral, you can wear a red one. That's not a belt. It's not worn around the waist. It's worn a lot higher uh, between the navel and the chest. So it sort of sits a little bit higher like a, an empire waist uh, dress, if I've got that right. I don't know. Um, let's think about the amis for a second. That's this little thing, uh, very badly ironed there on the left. Uh, Joris, you have a, a, a lesson to teach them there. Uh, ours are much nice, much more nicely ironed than that, as, as, uh, as Makiko knows. This is a big square of linen with two big tassels attached to it there. Now, here's your problem. If you're wearing something like this or this, or, hang on a minute, this. You don't want your dirty neck getting anywhere close to this valuable embroidery. Remember? I remember my mother always used to say when I was a child, hands, knees, hands, knees face, neck and knees before you go to bed. Because uh, she knew that the neck, uh, and that was my least favorite thing to wash before bedtime, but often the thing that got dirtiest. So this, this little thing, this amice, here it is, it has two purposes. First of all, because it's easily laundered and taken away, you can tie it round your neck like this so that your fancy embroidery doesn't touch your neck whether it's a stole or a cope or a chasuble, this thing is going to stop that from happening, the amice. 
Second of all, it's crossed over at the front here, and it's going to cover up any other clothes that you might be wearing underneath. So you could turn up to church in a, you know, a, I don't know, a Marcel, or, or well, not that that would be visible underneath all of this, uh, or some sort of dreadful thing that you'd thrown on at the last minute, and this amice is going to cover everything up so nobody sees what you're wearing underneath, so that no secular garment is going to be visible as you celebrate communion or that you hover around uh, the altar. Uh, you put it on in a very specific way. First of all, you throw it over your head, like a sort of bonnet or a hood. Uh, and then you throw it, uh, uh, lower it down to your neck and tie the ribbons crosswise uh, around your torso. Bring them behind you and then tie it in the front. So it makes a nice neat crossover here at the neck. And when you put it on, once again, there's a very special prayer to be said. Um, Place upon me, O Lord, the helmet of salvation, that I may overcome the assaults of the devil. So this is, uh, a, a, once again, a sort of exorcism prayer that used to be said, still is said, actually, when you put an amice on uh, before you celebrate communion. Uh, uh, they used to say it in Latin. I'm not going to put you through that. Finally, these things don't come cheap. Here you go. If you want a chasuble, uh, you can spend uh, thousands and thousands of dollars on these. these. This is the cheap end of the range. Uh, this is just, uh, you know, for, for your average nylon jobby. Uh, they go up to thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, these things. There you've got a polyester one. I wouldn't get near the candles in that for the life of me because you'd probably go straight up into flames. But there's probably a flame retardant in them. But you see, wearing these things for the sake of it just seems to be not really quite the business. Do you know what I mean? If you're going to go for it, uh, you might as well buy something respectful and that honours what you're doing uh, and not go for something that's cheap and cheerful. Let's move on to liturgical colours, because time is ticking by. Where are we? Yes, it is. The history of these liturgical colours is a really fascinating one. In, in the medieval period, in fact, colour was seen in a very interesting way. They felt that colour, the colour of your clothes, for instance, was this sort of opaque envelope that, that covered the body. And opinion was divided on what this actually meant. Were these colours purely uh, external? Were they um, a sort of artifice? Were they uh, a, a luxury? If so, these colours were nothing to do with what you were about to celebrate around the altar. These are not external things that you're looking for. Around the altar you want white and black maybe gold, uh, but uh, any other colours like purple or red or green were considered to be sort of not the thing. On the other hand, argued another group of people in the medieval period, colour was something to do with light, and light was the first of God's creations. Do you remember this when we did our course on church architecture and we looked at the Abbé Suger uh, of um, Saint-Denis who uh, initiated in France the Gothic uh, style, opened up those ambulatories to light that poured in through these stained glass windows, multicolored, And on the door there of Saint-Denis, you've got a hymn to the light, uh, that God creates light as the first thing, and with light comes the refraction of colour. Therefore, colour shares a divine nature, and you should use colour in the church. Interestingly enough, St. Bernard of Clairvaux was against the use of colour in church, but Abbot Suger, this great pioneer of the Gothic cathedrals, was for colour in church. You remember the Cistercian abbeys? Those, those drastically simple uh, abbeys, completely white, 
no decoration, no colour around them at all. They broke off from the Benedictines because they felt that the Benedictines had gone too slack and they'd got too much ornament and things in the church. Uh, the Cistercians pared everything down simply to white and black, even in their habits, the, the, the things that they wore. However, the, the pro-colour party won. And as the church began to establish itself in medieval Europe, it created its proper codes and its systems that were related to colour. Just think of the heraldic shields that we have in the church, full of all sorts of different colour that bears a deep heraldic significance. Gold is used for certain things, green is used for certain things, red and blue signify certain things. So just as it was being pioneered in the medieval period around heraldic symbols, it was also being pioneered in the church to take on liturgical significance. So that's where our colours really take off in the church's year, at least in the Western church, um, uh, just like the sumptuary codes and the heraldic shields of the time. It was the sort of liturgical equivalent of that movement. Colour also carried huge moral significance. So black and white were considered to be sober and chaste and simple. Here's an interesting connection. In the Reformation, remember when we looked at the Reformation we discovered the, that the invention of the printing press meant that Bibles could be printed in great numbers. What were the colours there? Black and white. The Reformers said black and white in church. It seems to be, either consciously or subconsciously, a way of invoking the printed text as well. That the black and white of the text are the black and white of the colours that the priest or the minister wears in a reformed church. Uh, to make a direct comparison between liturgical dress and the word of God. Other colours in the Reformation were considered out of the question. They didn't want them. Even in the medieval church, as they were developing these different colours, uh, which we'll look at in a little minute, uh, certain colours were considered to be unusable, like bright yellow, for instance, was not a colour that was adap adapted in, adopted by, by, by the church, or incidentally, necessarily by the heraldic codes either. Uh, the, gold, maybe, but certainly not bright yellow. Uh, or flashy sort of multicolored fabrics, for instance. And still other colors were uh, considered as imbued with religious significance, like red uh, and green. Let's have a little look. Here's what these colors were thought to symbolize. White was thought to symbolize purity or innocence or celebration. Black was thought to um, stand for abstinence and penitence and mortification. Red invoked shed blood, the blood of Christ, uh, the blood of the martyrs, for instance. It signified signif uh, uh, sacrificing everything for the sake of divine love, like Jesus on the cross. It also symbolized the fire of love and the fire uh, of Pentecost that came down on the heads of the, de the disciples and the people gathered in the upper room. Uh, green symbolized growth and spring and nature. And violet uh, symbolized repentance and preparation and mourning. Uh, now, other colors could be used as well. Rose color, for instance, a sort of pale pink, uh, can be used, I think, twice a year. At the, uh, as it symbolizes a sort of lightening of the Lenten discipline. So it can be used, for instance, on the fourth Sunday in Lent. That is Mi Carême, uh, or Daffodil Sunday, as we call it at Saint-Esprit, when we distribute Mothering Sunday, as it's called in England. It's always the fourth Sunday uh, in Lent, because it mentions Mother Church in the Collect. Uh, or Gaudate Sunday, and that's the third Sunday of Advent. That's because the antiphon of the day uh, says, uh, begins with the word Gaudate, or rejoice, rejoice. The Lord is near. Uh, blue can be used for the Virgin Mary, 
uh, and for Advent in the Sarum Rite. The Sarum Rite was based in Salisbury uh, in England, and it was uh, rather like the Gallican Rite in France, uh, where these uh, where the surplus came from. Uh, and blue was considered to be the permitted colour for Advent uh, within within the Sarum Rite. Also within the Sarum Rite. During Lent, instead of using purple, you could use unbleached linen. That is a linen that has a sort of slightly brown uh, cast to it. That's quite a nice way uh, of going through Lent uh, with that colour. Um, now, these colours appear in different places in the church. Um, so it's not just in the stole or in the chasuble. You're going to see these colours appearing uh, in the priest and the minister's dress, yes, in the stole, in the chasuble, in the cope, uh, in the lappets of the, of the mitre for the bishops. You'll see the colours in the bookmarks in the Bible, uh, hanging down in the front of the Bible. Uh, you'll also see them sometimes hanging in front of the lectern. There's this big square coloured piece of cloth uh, that hangs in front of the lectern or the pulpit. Sometimes you will have an altar uh, fall, uh, just as we saw earlier on in St. John the Divine, that thing with the imperial state crown on it. Uh, this great altar fall would be in the colour of the season. And then you'll see it also on the altar itself in the burse, which contains the little folded up cloth that's been underneath the chalice and pattern when you've celebrated communion, and the veil which covers uh, the communion vessels before and uh, sometimes after you've celebrated communion. And also you will find these colours echoed in the church's flowers as well, just as you do at the moment. Uh, you can see that we've got purple flowers uh, on uh, around the altar uh, for, uh, for the Advent season, or at least for the moment. The colours will change as we go along, but I'll explain that when we do church flowers. So when are these colours used and why are they used at these particular periods? Let's go through the church's year. Advent. We've already said that Advent, as we discovered a couple of weeks ago, is a bit of an ambiguous season. What's it for? Uh, is it looking forward to the second coming of Christ? Uh, is it looking forward to Christmas? Is it supposed to be a time of preparation for baptism, just like Lent is? Because in the old Celtic rites, people were baptised at Epiphany, just as Jesus was baptised uh, during the season of Epiphany. So, uh, after, well, in the season of Epiphany, I suppose we could call it. Uh, so Advent has this sort of vacillation between uh, purple and blue. I think that's why you can use blue for Advent, but not for Lent. So purple, it's a, series, it's a season of preparation, a season of looking forward, a season in the olden days of preparation through repentance for, for the celebration of the Incarnation. So you're going to be using purple or, or blue. Christmas time, the incarnation, second most important festival in the church's calendar, you're going to be using white and gold for that season. For the Sundays between Epiphany, that's the 12th day of Christmas when you're going to be using white and gold, and Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, uh, you're going to be using green now, this is called ordinary time, be not because it's boring uh, necessarily, or at least I, I hope not, but because it's not been set aside for a specific celebration of incarnation or crucifixion or, or Pentecost or something of that sort. And green is for growth, uh, the growth of the church, the, the call of the first disciples, which you hear about during the uh, the season, the ordinary season of Epiphany, uh, between the end of Christmas and the beginning of Lent. Um, for Lent, obviously, this is a season of repentance and uh, preparation, and so purple is going to be used for this period, uh, for this uh, season. Uh, during Holy Week, that is beginning on Palm Sunday all the way through to Good Friday, uh, red is worn for the Passion. Uh, and death of Christ, it's evoking Christ's blood on the cross. Incidentally, an alb is not worn uh, for the Good Friday celebration. Normally, the priest is just going to wear a black cassock with a red stole over the top of it, um, the, the white being kept for the, uh, the celebration of Easter. 
uh, when uh, Easter season comes around, obviously this is rejoicing, resurrection, purity, new birth, baptism, and you're going to be using white and gold for that season, the six-week season of Easter. And for Pentecost, uh, fire, the red, the flames that come down on the head of the, of the disciples and, and the people gathered in the upper room. And from Pentecost to the first Sunday of Advent, well, you're back in ordinary time and we've been using green fairly consistently for all of that. That's the general schema of the thing. But the colours might actually change during these seasons uh, uh, for the feast days of saints. I would say that if you are in the season of uh, um, uh, Lent, for instance, and a saint's day comes, sometimes that saint's day can be postponed, uh, and sometimes the saint's day will be celebrated in the appropriate colour for the saint. So if it's a martyr, you're going to be wearing red. Uh, if it's an apostle, you're more likely to be wearing white. Uh, so even in Lent, uh, the, the rule that purple needs to be used can be set aside in certain circumstances. Uh, for baptisms or funerals or weddings, the colour is going to change. Uh, if a saint was martyred, the colour will be red, and if not, it's going to be white or gold. And for baptisms and weddings, the stole is usually going to be white and gold. Uh, but for funerals, the tradition used to be that people would wear purple for a funeral for, uh, to symbolise uh, preparation, to symbolise repentance. Uh, but nowadays, white is often used for funerals uh, to symbolise the fact that the person's now in the hands of Christ the Redeemer. They don't need to repent anymore. Uh, they don't need to prepare anymore. Their repentance and their preparation is done, and now we're celebrating them. Uh, as co-citizens uh, uh, with the angels and the saints in glory. So uh, white can be worn for that. In some churches, black and gold is used for All Souls Day. That's the day after All Saints Day. Uh, and on All Saints Day, uh, white and gold are, are worn for that particular uh, season. I think that that is all I have got for this evening. I'm sorry I didn't have time to put some pictures up of those uh, of those colours in certain different places. Now, before I ask Joris to conclude with a little prayer for us, uh, have people got questions or observations or things that we haven't covered that you'd like to see us cover? If so, just please write it down in the comments. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that's all we have for the moment. Um, and uh, Joris is going to finish with a prayer for us. Ce n'est pas nous-mêmes, mais Jésus-Christ Seigneur que nous proclamons. Quant à nous-mêmes, nous nous proclamons vos serviteurs à cause de Jésus-Christ. Car le Dieu qui en a dit, qui a dit, que la lumière brille au milieu des ténèbres, c'est lui-même qui a brillé dans nos cœurs pour faire resplendir la connaissance de sa gloire qui rayonne sur le visage du Christ. Bénissons le Seigneur. Nous rendons grâce à Dieu.